for this panel. Uh, this will be an Indie Plus game night panel, and we are talking about sex and dice. Now, the intro blurb that we had on the website is, sex in real life is a minefield of hang-ups and opportunities for embarrassment, even when done in private. Is it really something we should be doing in games in front of our friends? Even gender switching, men playing female characters, and vice versa can be awkward. And once we get into areas such as underage sex or forced sex, then we're mm. deep into taboo territory. Is sex like going to the toilet? Something that characters should do, but no one wants to role play. Our panelists will explore these issues raised by sex at the game table and discuss if there really are things that are off limits. Quick disclaimer, please note, this panel will touch on a wide range of topics related to sex. If this is likely to upset or offend you, please don't watch. The views expressed in this panel do not represent those of Indie Plus, because we have no views. We're just Indie Plus, the thing. And these are people, and they've been nice enough to give me some time. So I will introduce alphabetically. Emily Kerr Boss is a game designer from Western Massachusetts. She pioneered, in, she pioneered uh, role-playing games including romance, love, and sex uh, in a central and intimate way that made people that people thought was crazy in 2005, but it's become much more accepted now. Her games were influenced by the Nordic Jeep Form Collective, uh, which you can find at jeepin.org, and often includes live-action techniques that explore emotions through role-play. Welcome, Emily. Thanks so much for having me. Next we have Joe McDonald now. He's the author of Monster Hearts and the Quiet Year, and a frequent contributor to conversation about safe space and queer representation in the story games community. Hello, Joe. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you. McGay Baker is the owner of Night Sky Games, and she's been involved with independent publishing for 15 years. Besides publishing her own games, she has been a sex ed teacher for 16 years, focusing on teenagers and adults. She also spent a dozen years as a counselor for women and families in the postpartum stage, dealing with issues around postpartum depression, stress, and anxiety. This past winter, Meg spent time in Ethiopia, field testing games for social change with the girl effect. She and her husband, fellow game designer D. Vincent Baker, raised their three sons in western Massachusetts. Hello, Meg. Hello. And last but not least, we have Zach. Zach S. is a full-time artist who is also sometimes a porn actor who runs a blog called Playing D&D with Porn Stars. It's about playing D&D with porn stars. <laughs> he also wrote Vornheim, the Complete City Kit, personal favorite of mine, a supplement for D&D style games, which won some awards. Hello, Zach. Welcome to the panel. Hey. Great. Well, uh, we have quite a wide variety of experts here and uh, people who may not be experts but have wrote games and thought about it a lot, and that's important. I crowdsource questions uh, to the Indie Plus followers and a number of people that I think are interesting across the spectrum of the role-playing game hobby, and we're going to kind of break them up into categories. So first, we'll kind of talk about social contract. Uh, Kieran Ice asked, if a group is comfortable with the subject matter as handled by the participants, does it need to matter outside of that play group? No. No. <laughs> this is going to be a um, quick panel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kieran. No, um... Do I here's an, so do I have permission to do the the things in my game that I like? Um, you mean based on not thinking about other people's judgments about what should happen in, at your table? Right. It's it's kind of like sex, you know. We, we what people do in their bedrooms is private. What people do at the ta the the gaming table is private. But um, but yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, do we have the right to have opinions about what other people are gaming? Uh, in a moral or judgmental way. I mean, you have a right to have an opinion about the people, but their game doesn't make them worse or better because they're still those people. Like, you know, like, the, at worst, their game is evidence that they're those people. Hmm, like, good point. Like, the Nazi lapel pin doesn't make a Nazi worse. It's, <laughs> it's just evidence that they're a Nazi, you know, and so I feel like a lot of time just the evidence value of something that you hear about is taken as the offense where really the offense is the person in the first place and the the act at the game table is just just more than anything a helpful 
helpful evidence that they are that person, you know. And that's the real problem, if there is even is a problem, you know. I feel like there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's there's subcontext on that question, and what Zach just said, but also, you know, what you do, if it's if it's your your gaming group and it's your friends and you're digging it and you're all into what's going on at the table, awesome! I don't care what system you're using. I don't care what dice you use. I don't care what clothes you're wearing. I don't care any. I don't. I just don't care. Awesome! Go to it. Uh, I just played 316. We slaughtered an entire planet full of in, of sentient beings. It was awesome. We got to feel guilty about it too. That was an added bonus. I didn't feel guilty. Oh yes, you did. I saw it in your face. No, I didn't. I really <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to sex. Back to sex. But yeah, and also like Emily said, uh, you know, one of the underlining things in that question, I think, is is it okay for me to do things that other people don't like? You know, my kink is not your kink in sex or in gaming. That's okay. So while I think that, like, I agree with everything you guys have said, I also want to put on the table that part of what we're doing when we're playing role-playing games is we are uh, challenging certain stories we have about the world and we're reinforcing certain stories we have about the world. And um, I think that it's important that we're really cognizant of, um, you know, if we're, if we're playing a, a story game and that story game involves rape, we are, we're, we're reifying a bunch of stories about rape. Um, and I think it's just really important to be, like, careful about, yeah, about which stories we are engaging and which uh, narratives we're reinforcing in our own minds. Totally. We, we each get to make that choice. Like, yeah. I do not get to come and sit in your house, Joe, and tell you, here is the story you should be telling at your table. You know, if we're in a game together, we can make that agreement. We can figure out, like, okay, what do we want to do and how do we want to look at this angle especially when we get into sexuality or especially when we get into things that there may be, you know, whatever other topic that may require of us a little more of like, okay, where, where do I want to go with this? What are, what are my boundaries here? What avenues do I, where do I want to push? Where do I want to explore? Um, but there's a huge difference between uh, being cognizant of what we're reinforcing in our own minds and, uh, being aware of what stories in the broader world we might want to be reinforcing or challenging or setting up, um, and where we want to be role-playing something that is not us. You know, I am never going to be a six-foot-tall guy, but if I get to role-play that and try that on, awesome, you know, okay, fine. Uh, but all those things being true and being good doesn't give me a, a place to say this is how you should do it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think it's it's up to every group and every participant in every group to make those choices about what they're engaging with, and their answers are going to be right. Uh, and so I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, I was just putting on the table that, hey, it turns out that's actually like a really weighty decision that each group is going to be making, because it's going to, we're going to take that uh, with us when we leave the table in some small way. Mm. And we're making I those decisions. I don't think it is. I mean, mm. I actually think it's not a weighty decision unless it becomes one at the table. Like, I think you... It's like at the end of the year, you do your taxes and you look at all your receipts. And that's kind of... If you can make an equivalent to that, like when you actually take an action that has a moral implication toward another person you're adding up all of the judgments you've ever made in your life, all the facts, all the fictions you've ever had about that idea. That's when you draw a line under it and go, now, I'm, when you're actually doing something in the real world, then you do all the math and all the choices. But when you're looking at this one line item on your taxes where you paid three seventy five dollars for a toothbrush, that's the equivalent in many games of how much what happened in that game mattered in terms of your judgments about what real people are like in the real world. And I think a lot of people, if you're not playing a game which is specifically discovering shit you didn't already know about people you don't already know, people can tie themselves in knots worrying about what story they're reifying in a game when really they're just sitting around with a bunch of people they already know 
talking about roughly the same things they'd be talking about if they weren't playing a game. Hmm. So hmm. you only regulate that conversation when you're really moving into a territory where it costs way more than 375. When you're, you know, and I think take like you don't every single time you go buy a toothbrush, you don't have to wring your hands about it. Sometimes play is just play. And if you're comfortable talking to people 23 hours of the day about the variety of subjects in their lives, and then you have a game, and then during that game you talk only about a subset of those things, the game doesn't make it special or different. You know, like if you're talking to people about their real experiences with sex normally, and then you suddenly talk to them in a game, the game doesn't have some special sacred power that means you have to suddenly take it much more seriously, especially because we're talking in the context of your own game, your own mm. group, you know? Interesting. Oh, I think that's great. Um, so I'm going to move on and kind of tag into uh, this super violent stuff that uh, Emily and, and Meg just enjoyed. <laughs> Judd Carlman asks, um, what does it say about our hobby that some gamers are often comfortable narrating all manner of violent acts but are squeamish, if not downright hateful, about narrating sex acts? Um, it's a, wow. Well, we can talk about that, like, okay, what does it mean for our hobby as it is in America right now? Um, kind of. And... Um, the clearly we're dealing with a lot of baggage as Americans uh, from our history in America of how sex is dealt with um, through all the culture. Uh, so a lot of that baggage just shows up um, in people talking about sex. Period. Uh, a lot of people are not very comfortable talking about sex, even in this, even in a very like really helpful place where you're talking about it with a partner or with with people who you might want to talk to <laughs> about interesting subjects you know so um, I think the question is predicated on a whole different a whole body of, of, of cultural uh, baggage and stuff um, and then there's notion of narrating uh, things that are more personal or less personal you know, if, I, if I've been, um, if I had had a background that involved a lot of physical violence, um, I might be narrating, I might have a different relationship to narrating physical violence. Uh, it may be more personal, uh, more intense, more intimate. Um, it's not. Uh, and then there's a thing about um, when you are, this is weird. Give me a little sideline here. When you are looking to create a uh, emotional state in someone uh, or experience one yourself, it's easier to do that in accessing things that are unpleasant than that are pleasant. If I say to all of you, okay, okay, so you're in a room and uh, there's this smell and like it's like a really like overripe nasty smell uh, layered with gasoline and um, like it's just something rotting. You all can relate to that. But if I say, all right, you're in a room and it just smells beautiful. It's like the most wonderful, happy, cool smell. It just makes you feel, it makes you feel sexy. And then I say, that's all I can, I can't say more because I, I can say, oh, it's like the beach. And then someone's going to be like, oh, God, no, sand, not, you know, finding the things that we can tap into in a group that are, that hit our hot buttons is harder than finding things that we can tap into a group, in a group that hit our, like, pain or danger or fear or, you know, those buttons all across, across the board. You know, what, you know I'm going to have a, a broader uh, receptivity to you're in danger than uh, saying you're turned on because the, what turns people on is very specific, is, is more specific and I think that is part of why it's more difficult or more challenging or, or people feel a little more hesitant 
to talk specifically about sex acts or sexual arousal or anything like that in gaming than violence. Um, at least that's part of my angle. Uh, Joe, what are your thoughts? Um, I think that there's also the factor that like narrating violence isn't uh, something that makes us vulnerable. Um, and that's just part of, I think, how we've, in, in most cases, that's just part of how we've been socialized. We, um, and narrating something sexual does make us vulnerable. Um, and the exception there would be like making uh, sex into a joke uh, doesn't make you vulnerable. And so you actually see a lot of that in uh, traditional play as well, right? Um, but yeah, um, talking earnestly about uh, something that our character finds sexually you know, stimulating and that we might as well. Um, puts us on the line, and it puts us up for judgment, and that's scary. And also, like, why, like, a lot of times there's no social reason to do that. Like, like most of the people in the panel besides me actually play games where there's lots of sex in the game, and I don't, and I can't think of a reason to. Like, I can't think of anything I'd be getting out of it um, most of the time, whereas... When you're talking about violence, you're usually talking it's play, so it's an intellectual challenge. It's goal oriented, like tic tac toe or something. You know, like you put this here, you put that there, and it like there's a goal. And so, like it's the reason that you would do that is the reason you would play almost any other game, like pool or football or frisbee. You know, like it's a tactical issue. Whereas if you're narrating sex, you're already choosing to be, I think, less goal-oriented usually and more, like, more spitballing creative ideas. You know, you're, you're bouncing, you're brainstorming more or you're, you're narrating more and you're less problem-solving. And I think there's, in addition to that, there's, like, two reasons that I can think of uh, that I find it really uh, worthwhile to make myself vulnerable and put myself in line to have that kind of sex and sexuality part of play. And the first is that um, being vulnerable is sort of like a high. Um, you know, you, you put yourself out there and you're like, oh shit, my friends might think I'm a total freak and I might uh, not be able to be, play with them again. But then they accept what you're saying and you get a rush from that. Um, and related to that, there's that experience of being understood. Um, and I think that those, those are things that I don't experience very often when I'm narrating violence in a game. But I do experience them almost all the time when I'm narrating sex and sexuality and romance and games. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would necessarily say that um, I narrate a lot of sex in games. It's just I have games where sex is a part of the picture. Um, you know, Monster Hearts or Apocalypse World or Thousand One Nights or Under My Skin or Hot Guys Making Out or you know, things like this where, okay, Maybe under my skin and hot guys making out. Sex is a little even more on the table with those. But the point is not narrating sex. I'm not saying, you know, okay, now I put my hand here and then squelching. You know, that's that's it's it's more um, it's it's more about recognizing that as part of the picture. And I find it very interesting, specifically the idea of it being goal oriented, um, because the goal orientedness that comes up when we're talking. You know, most recent example was last night. We're playing Monster Hearts, and you know I can roll to turn someone on because that's my goal. Like, okay, this person, you know, there's a threat here. If I could turn him on, it on into some weird monster, but that gives me an upper hand in the situation. Uh, so it's not narrating sex, it's including the possibility of sex and recognizing sexuality as part of my character. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's lost. something that I would totally, that t is totally encompassed in games that I play, like that aspect of it. It just doesn't seem very fraught. Hmm, yeah. <laughs> like, I know, never, does like, not either. <laughs> is this person attracted to you? I'll roll a die. They are. And then, you know, it, it usually resolves pretty quickly. There's a decision that goes beyond game design, which is, does the group want to or not want to linger on any given detail, you know, right. and some people do more than others, and and I think that's 
that's part of that. Like, seduction as a tactic is common to a lot of different kinds of fiction, but I think the, the fine line between, like, romance adventure and adventure that has romance, like, like between, like, Romancing the Stone and Indiana Jones, the first one where there was romance, is, like, it's a fine line, but it has more to do with where does the director of the film's attention lie than any sort of technical division. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to use the words you use there, I think it's also, like, specifically, it's about whether you linger. Um, right. And when you're, like, when a game um, feels like it's about sex and romance as, as opposed to just including them, it's because you're lingering long enough that it's, like, it becomes uncomfortable, and you think that that's an exciting uncomfortability, but exploring the feelings that come from that lingering is what makes it, yeah. Yeah, like that's the big thing you're doing. Bacchanalia. You know, I, either, you know, Paul's original Bacchanalia or the card game person, that game lingers in beautiful ways. I totally dig that game. So, uh, there's some more questions. Or Can there, I talk, are. though? Yeah, yeah, I was, really I was trying to actually have a lot to say about this. I'm sorry. Um, I thought and talked, uh, worked upon this whole question a lot when I was working on Breaking the Ice, um, and you brought up Under My Skin, Meg. Um, and Under My Skin, actually, I think the, the how many people uh, are involved makes a big difference. Kelly made a note of that. Um, in Under My Skin, it's a game all about crossing lines. Um, you're, it's a social circle of friends, some of whom are in partnerships and some of whom aren't. And over the course of the game, everyone is tempted to step out of their relationship or start a relationship with somebody who's in another relationship. So it's about dealing with fidelity and love and you know relationships and their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and in most, I mean, I, most of the games that I've played or run with it, um, we haven't actually shown what happens. So it's, it, we sort of go up to that line that Zach was talking talking about and say, okay, sex happens or sex doesn't happen, but what's really, really charged is the relationship stuff and the emotions that underlay the decisions about what's what's done, um, and then the fallout afterwards. But it's it's a game where you've got, you know, up to eight people playing, and the scenes are framed so that everybody's watching them, so it would feel kind of awkward to, like, perform sex, um, although I can completely understand and, and imagine another context where that's within the social contract, where, you know, you get into BDSM uh, scenario play, where that that's what people are there for. But in this game, that's not. You're there to try and tease out what's going on in the relationships. Um, whereas in Breaking the Ice, it's actually a game that's written for two people to play, although more people can play. And I really wrote it as a game very intentionally to work out gen gender issues in role-playing games because, you know, one of the standard things that you can do, you switch something between the two players. And a standard thing to do is to have, if you have a man and a woman playing, the man plays the woman and the woman plays the man. So there's a gender role switch, and it's about the first three dates that people go on. So there's all these negotiations about uh, emotions or sex. You know, do they have, do they kiss? Do they have sex? All these kinds of things. So when I was writing the game, I talked about how to talk about and negotiate the question of how much do you show, since that's really front and central in this game. It's not a side thing. It's not, you know, something that happens here or there, maybe. Um, uh, so the concepts that I used were lines and veils that Ron uh, Edwards talked about in the Sorcerer game. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's just a way of talking about that, saying, you know, here's the line, you know, do we want to um, deal with uh, sex? And it, it, a veil would be how much do we show, how much do we describe and narrate? And I really actually literally wrote in the game that this is absolutely a game that if you are, you know, uh, in a situation where you're playing this with somebody that you are attracted to and you want to use this to flirt or to be sexy, do it. Because the game's all about suggesting and making uh, descriptions about what goes well or doesn't go well in the game. So there's a, it, it ends up being sort of a romantic comedy kind of situation. So there's a little bit of lightness there. But, um, but as we all have known in our lives, you know, with, with, with sex and romance, things go, things so don't always go exactly as planned. So <laughs> that, that can bring you closer, though, and that's the intent of the game. So, so it, um, it, having that, the freedom of having just two people sort of uh, allows uh, more intimacy and more of the vulnerability that, that Joe was talking about. Thank you. Sorry, just wanted to get that in. <laughs> no, thank you. I was, I was <laughs> definitely coming to you, Emily. <laughs> in fact, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stay with you with the next question. Uh, yep. Joe Beeson, uh, who I may have messed up his last name because I only know him as Joe, the awesome guy from the Jank Cast, which is an amazing podcast you should totally listen to. He asks, 
Uh, what advice do you have for playing games with potential sexual content at a con setting, it's a convention, where you may not know the other players well, if at all? Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, if it, I think it really depends on the game. You know, um, there is a broad range of how much and how it's going to be represented that the sexual content is going to be. I mean, on, on one side, I've had stories from friends who got involved in games that were way more sexual in a way weirder, bad boundary kind of way than they ever would have known from describing it. So I think making sure that everybody knows pretty clearly what's going to be expected is like you know, the first thing. Um, and then um, in, uh, in my games where I do have a lot of potential sexual or deep emotional contact, I kind of build in time at the beginning where people can get to know one another. Um, Breaking the Ice has this whole character creation where you, you, you play off of one another and you actually have to talk to one another to figure out how you differ. So there's a little bit of ice breaking there. And Under My Skin, which is very serious in that, in that way, um, Actually, uh, I have people just share what their their real world relationship status is. That way, mm -hmm. at the get go, you know, even if you're playing for the next four hours that you're in love with and married to this person, they know and you know that you're actually married to somebody else, or you're sleeping with somebody <laughs> else, or, or you're poly, or whatever the hell it is, so that it's it's clear. So that because it's really easy actually for the boundaries to merge, especially when you have a really good experience, um, and to have a lot of bleed between the character and the the, the player about their emotions. So so that's just one of the, the the techniques that I use for that specific game. Obviously, that wouldn't be appropriate for most games. You're not going to do that in D and D or whatever. But um, <laughs> but, but that It'd works cool quite well. Cool, you did though. Uh, well, Zach, no. I don't know. I don't know Zach, <laughs> what would you think? Do you think that's something that you would do in in D and D? Have you ever had that occasion for that or? Any advice? I've never played in a con except like like as a player in, in situations that were kind of con-like. So mm -hmm. I have no good advice on running con games. <laughs> cool. All right. Appreciate the honesty. Joe, do you have any <laughs> thoughts? Yeah. Uh, in addition to what Emily said about flagging content really clearly in event descriptions, um, Three pieces of advice um, would be, like, the first one is have some kind of tool or mechanism in place where people can, like, really explicitly say, like, hey, I don't want that in the game. Um, so one example of that is Lines and Veils. Another example of that is having uh, the X card, which is a tool you can hold up the X card and say, like, uh, no, we're, we're going to stop for a second and edit that out of the game. I don't want that in here. This is my free time. I don't want to go there. Um, so having like a, a really concrete mechanism for people to say like no that's that's off the table. The next piece of advice is um, in addition to that, be really attentive to where people's comfort levels seem to be at. Um, having a concrete mechanism doesn't mean that everyone's going to use it. Um, and so yeah, just pay attention to people's vibes, pay attention to people's body language. Um, the more taboo or the more difficult the subject matter is getting, the more you should be paying attention to your fellow players. Um, and the third piece of advice is um, have at least one like water break where you leave the table um, so that if someone needs to step aside with you and be like, hey, I'm not super comfortable with this game anymore, or like, hey, I think I'm totally good to keep playing, but I want to talk through this, or if they just want to leave quietly and never return, they can do that. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a break check. The break check technique. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then just trust people are going to have tons of fun because it's probably going to be really exciting and everyone's there to do the same thing and there's probably not going to be an issue. But yeah. I like to ask, like right up front, like, okay, uh, so we're sitting down to play. I don't know what are we playing. Something. We're sitting down. To play, we're sitting down to play. Uh, Monster of the Week. Oh God, Monster of the Week's not really a good example. All right, we're sitting down to play Mon Monster, and I'd Arts? like to say, yeah, sure. And I'd like to say, okay, how sexy do you want this to be? You know, if I was playing in a con game and I'm playing a one-shot setting, and we're here, like, and there's like tons of other noise going on and other care, other games and stuff like that, I'm like, all right, uh, how sexy and how funny? You know, those are two questions, right? Because if it's sexy and serious. Oh. That's a very different game than it's sexy and wicked funny, you know. So they're just dials, and figure like, okay, where where does the table want to set that dial? 
um, and then go from there. I used um, PG rating, you know, like movie ratings as another tool right, for movie people to sort of set, too. just to figure out where everybody, so that you sort of have a, a similar sense of what you want to show. Yeah. Good suggestions. All right, uh, Marshall Miller asks, um, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, what about when you have a significant other uh, also at the table with you? And uh, what about when they're not at the table with you? How do you mitigate that risk to the real-world relationships that you have? This is a question about uh, jealousy and trust and communication and um, why are you not coming home because you're out with your gaming friends. I mean, this is way, this is a lot more than just sex at the table, especially the last, that la the last two. Um, you know, each couple is going to work that out differently for the, fir for the, for the first two, really. Um, you know, to do it successfully, I think you have to have a lot of trust. Um, that, you know, someone, your significant other can go have an awesome, hot, sexy game and then come back and say, oh my god, I have this awesome, hot, sexy game and you can be all cool, I want to know all about it. Because you know that, you know, it's a game. Um, and then people, like, people fall in love playing games. People meet their significant others, play games with them, get to know them, and hang out after and talk and things and realize, oh my god, I'm in love with this person and now we're gonna, you know, spend the next bunch of time together. So, bleed happens in both ways, both the way where you, uh, fall in love or become part of an intimate relationship because you met over the gaming table, or uh, that you... That, that causes problems for your relationship because of what's going on at the gaming table. That's a complex qu question about trust and communication. Um, I don't think there's any super great answers about how to do that. Um, but I think what you're getting at, Meg, is that it's not actually a gaming question. Exactly. Yeah, like, you're right. It's just a question about like any other activity you would yep. do where there's yep. flirting involved or you would you know, you're not in the same place at the same time, like... Yep. I've had yeah, some ex really. I've had some experiences where there's at least some things that we can do to pay attention to those dynamics. Like when I run under my skin, I always ask if there are couples who are playing together, um, do you guys want to be not in a romantic couple or do you want to be in a romantic couple? Because it can put pressures on your relationship and different ways, depending, because somebody's going to be sleeping with somebody else, fictionally, um, and uh, and the answers that the people have come up with are always very interesting, and some people, you know, it's, it's really not an issue, whatever, you know, it's just a game, it's fun, and other people have had the opportunity, because the game actually sort of sets it up that you can bring in your own emotions and your own life as much as you want to, and you don't have to put that out for anybody else, it's your own experience, but I've seen people really go deeply exploring certain aspects or weaknesses of their own relationships and mm -hmm. then ha be able to have that to c talk about later, you know, and have emotional experiences that are cathartic or even difficult, but that just move them to a different place with relationship with one another. And it was, I always feel like that's a privilege even, you know, like it's being done respectfully and, it, um, you know, we're creating this space together that we can let each other do that. But it's, yeah. you know, you really have to be have a group that's, down with that, and also the the people who are doing it have to be um, square with one another. So it comes back to that. But I've also had uh, people talk about playing breaking the ice with their partner, and that was harder than if it was um, people who were just flirting or weren't in a relationship already. Because it's like, wait a minute, we're, we've been arguing all week, and here you are being really nice to this fictional character, and what the hell is up with that? <laughs> Sounds like making a porn movie. <laughs> yeah. <absolutely. laughs> yep. Joe, did you have anything to add to this? Not really. I think uh, Zach nailed it. This doesn't really seem like a gaming question. So the gaming advice is don't be weird about real world relationships in your game. And if that needs if that's a complicated, difficult statement for you, then that's actually a relationship problem, not a gaming problem. Yeah. And mo like yeah, it's communication. And that's the underlying key in sex and like and gaming, you know everything. Every question we've answered so far, it, an underlying thing is talk to people. You know, figure it out what you guys both like. 
<laughs> that's, that's the underlying answer to all the questions we've had so far. I think, I think I'll I think. differ with the, the consensus here, because I think mostly it's not a gaming question, but I think it is a gaming question from a design standpoint that, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that even if it's not a mechanical thing, um, I, one of the first times, I, at an early time when I ran under my skin, I had people come back who had felt isolated and alienated because of how their real world um, like life lined up with their character's life. So I wrote in the rules, okay, GMs, these are things that you need to take into account because you have this information coming in. Mm. And it, you know, it's not like rolling dice, but it's it's a structure too. So so I, th I think there's ways where it comes in to the design I, as well. I think one of the places where there's friction is that like real relationship social dynamics are based on the answer is always like more information mm. whereas it's a fundamental of game design that hidden information or emergent information are important like I didn't know I was going to do that or uh, I didn't know that that was on your character sheet like those things are part of game design and so I think the difficulty some people might have is that those are two different imperatives uh, sometimes. Like the the discovery imperative, which is absolutely, it's really important in games, and the nobody discovers anything. You leave the house and I've discovered nothing by the time you come back dynamic, which is standard in a relationship. Um, and so I think that certain amount of the vagaries here might be just like know which of those things is going on and if you really need hidden things or secret things or emergent things recognize uh, like Emily said when they're emerging you know like mm -hmm. when is something that wasn't part of the social contract at the beginning of the game or the beginning of the relationship suddenly being discussed I love when that happens like when like I love when my characters. I'm playing a character, and I'm like, oh my, there's there's a totally different thing going on here with this character sexually than I thought. I totally dig that. <laughs> it's it doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, I I love it. Oh, everybody's faces all just change. <laughs> all anyway. right, uh, that was good. Um, I, this will probably be our last social contract related uh, question and this comes um, from Mo. I'm going to read the, the verbiage but try to summarize what I think he's trying to get to. Uh, this is from uh, Mo. I've never seen this last name before. Tusignan. Uh, Tusignan <laughs> sounds awesome and pretty uh, kind of rich French. and royal and awesome essentially. <laughs> I can't think of a good way to word this as a question, he says. It's about dealing she, with players. Is that, no. No, 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 that's no. the other Mo. I've seen Sorry. pictures of Mo, so it's... it's Sorry, eight. Mo. Multiple that's Mo's. Okay. I can't on. think of a... All right, thanks. Um, it's about dealing with players, being able to differentiate between the game world and the real world. I've seen issues in the past where players use the game... Uh, to make sexual advances on another player. I've seen people confusing things that are happening in-game for things happening in real life. Also, I've seen things that have happened in-game leading to things in real life, both with good and bad results. And, mm -hmm. and, and Meg, I think you kind of summed this up when we talked earlier. How can people control the, the bleed between an intense experience in a game and what's going on in real life? Right. And in ways, this echoes the question we, you know, the question before. This is like an expansion on that. You know, it's looking at uh, it, this question recognizes that, that recognizes that that happens, and points out how complicated it is to navigate through that place. Um, I, you know, I have a, a great story which I'm not going to take up the time here to tell in full, but just uh, a guy in our social circle who was wicked hot. And everybody got crushed out on him at some point in, uh, or other. Male, female, different orientation, doesn't matter. Any, at some point in time, you had a crush on Neil. And I never did until I, had a, I played a game with him, and our characters were romantically linked in the game. And I came home and told Vincent, I was like, oh my god, I get it. Neil's really hot. <laughs> <laughs> it was really fun. But that's the thing where, you know, pretending that we can completely divorce our experiences in game where there, we are playing things, we are feeling things, we are expressing creative stuff, you know, that does have some impact on us. And while we can say, okay, this is just a game, keep it in its proper place, we can also recognize that when we're 
playing a game or doing anything creative with other people, there's going to be some transference of experience. Uh, and sometimes that's great, sometimes that's not great. Um, everything he says is true. I don't know if there's a great way to control the bleed other than, other than really recognize that it's there. Um, have some way to process it afterward. You know, if you're playing a game and you're and in that game you're super super angry at a bunch of like you're just angry and I want to kill everything. You know, maybe figure out a way to do something more chill before you go back to your family. And if you're in a game where it's like super super sexy and hot, figure out a fun way to disperse that energy before you have to go back to your day job. <laughs> <laughs> so in in the uh, wording of that question, Mo listed three examples of mm -hmm. uh, different things going on, and um, it, the the question wording seems to uh, suggest that they're all equivalent, but mm -hmm. one really stood out. So the first one was, I've seen issues in the past where players use the game to make sexual advances on other players, mm -hmm. and then it lists two examples of high bleed where your experiences and the player and the character's experiences uh, merge and interweave. But that first example is a fundamentally different thing going on. I agree. Um, that's about uh, creep behavior, and that's about abusing social contract, whether intentional or not. Um, so I just wanted to flag that and say that that, that struck me in that wording, because that's a very different issue. Um, I, I feel like there's interesting ways that how you play can deepen or in increase the likelihood of these things. If you're doing something that's live action, there's sort of a, a more one-to-one -one in what you're doing and what you're saying and what the, the feelings can be because rather than just describing having sex with somebody or whatever, having the having relationship happen, you're actually in some way acting it out. Um, and obviously LARPs or live-action role-playing is, is, that's a, again, a huge variety of different types of gaming. Um, but um, the in the Scandinavia and the Nordic countries, um, there's been a lot of talk, um, and they resonated strongly with the whole concept of bleed and thinking about how to deal with that because in their community or in certain parts of their community, they actually play towards having strong mm -hmm. emotional experiences on the part of the player based on the experiences of the character and, and, uh, and vice versa, I think, too. Um, but... They, they actually do a lot of the things that you talked about, Meg, about having very conscious uh, workshops beforehand to bring you into the game, into the fiction, and um, to help you get, get tools to be able to uh, do the activities in ways that are very structured. Um, there's actually a whole whole body of technique that's about acting out sex um, by using touch on the arms and uh, other neutral places that um, allow you to have a very intimate, sensual experience with somebody else but not actually have sex. Um, and then, you know, it, it's a LARP. If you want to run off and have sex with somebody in a room and uh, and nobody cares, then nobody cares. But that's sort of crossing the line. And that's a place where even the, you know, the the if you are playing a game and you are you and this other person in no negotiating that, oh, hey, we're flirting. We are actually flirting right now here, <laughs> you and me. Then that's that's like another step. But that that's a really... Um, big thing, it's not going to happen probably at a tabletop role-playing game, but if you're acting things out, there's um, there's probably an even greater need to be more clear about what you're doing and how you're doing it and who you're doing with and on what level you're doing it um, because you, you can easily hurt people or yourself. And um, and then debriefing afterwards, there's a, there's a commonly used technique called de-rolling, which is that when you end the game, um, you know, everybody together might gather and then you say, okay, now some prop or something that you had that signifies this character, this role, take it off and put it down like a way to signal to yourself on a deeper level that you're ending this experience. Mm -hmm. And then you go through usually a whole process of talking with a variety of different people about what it was like, giving you an opportunity to talk to the facilitators to give them feedback on how it worked for you and areas where maybe you need to process things out further and having buddies that you weren't paired with in the game necessarily so that you can talk afterwards about Fallout um, and um, I, I, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of structured things that you can do. Um, most games don't need them, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> but it's nice to know that you, you you can have tools to fall back on if you need them. 
Zach, uh, did you have any thoughts to add on, on bleed and how it can affect real life uh, relationships? Our technique is just everyone at the table has had sex with everyone else uh, before <laughs> the game ever started, so that you um, but uh, as but but like that's the joke version. But the serious version is actually, I think, with a lot of games, you've had more intense, angry, difficult, stressful, weird social uh, uh, issues with the people long before the game than you will have in the game. And I think that listening to this conversation, I think for me the differences between game and non-game experiences with the same group of people is way bigger than the difference between a game with a bunch of people you're friendly with and a structured game with a bunch of strangers at a con. Mm -hmm. Those two things need different sets of rules, whereas for my group, and I think a lot of people's uh, home RPG groups, game and non-game follow almost the same social rules. Like, we're having dinner, we're watching we're watching a movie on TV, we're all going to get on the bus and go to the beach, and you follow all the same rules about who you flirt with and who you don't flirt with and how you flirt with them, and then when you play a game, you're doing the same thing. Whereas I think you get a bunch of strangers and you're playing a game, those are, are more different experiences. So um, I'm hearing about, yeah, so I just... For me, the, the place where there's a gap and you ask yourself what you're doing is, is a different place. Cool. All right. Well, now we've uh, exited the social contract area. And uh, thanks, everybody. Now we'll talk a little bit about uh, game design questions. And I'll start off with uh, Sage Latora, who asked, what ground hasn't been covered in games that you would like to see them cover? Who would you like to see cover them? Um, who they like? I'm sure you guys will say your own names, but no. But what games? Uh, what do we need to cover? What What's out there? Hmm. Zach, did you want to leave that off? I mean, when I think of a thing like that, mostly I just think of artists who, like, just I, I think in terms of setting, like artists define the setting far more than the rules and the writers do, even though the rules and the writers are the people who usually get the idea to make the game in the first place. But when you think of a classic game, you're almost always thinking of the imagery. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like when I'm thinking of what should be covered, I think any idea that anyone else in the panel has, but drawn really well, you know? <laughs> like... Um, like I mean, a lot of people will say, oh, we need more people of color or, like, diverse body types in games. And I'm like, we do if the person drawing them can make them as cool and sexy and amazing as they did with all of the sort of standard body types up till now. Like, there's a, a recent RPG, and this kind of strays from sex, but I think it makes the point, um, uh, a recent RPG about, it's like a, basically a D&D-like RPG, but it's set in Africa. And right. for me, I was super concerned about what the art looked like because I felt like if it looked like repetitive, like loincloth spear, every character, it was just the image that you see in the background of a Tarzan movie in the art, then no matter how good the rules were or no matter how much was in that, it wouldn't create a new life for that material. And what you needed was artists who had lots of diverse, complex, sophisticated ideas of what an African adventure RPG could look like. And I feel like the same thing should be done with sexual material. Like, I drew a picture of a really fat succubus a couple years ago. And I was proud of it because it was, like, a really sexy picture of somebody who was really, like, atypical body type. And it was just, like, that was a... For me, that was, like... That's hard to do. Just including it, just having a line in the book that says you can look however you want, you can do whatever you want, that to me isn't enough. To me, art isn't about making things or including things. It's about making them desirable and wantable and making them have a, a life outside of people wanting to engage that life. So for me, I guess that's where I would start with things I would like to see. Is just how do you make X, Y, Z not just include it, but make it genuinely sexy. And I think there's a pretty short list of artists who have that talent. Um, and I think that that once once they do it, it's done. You know? Mm. Yeah, I don't want to talk over everybody else's time, but that's where I would start. I think it's a really good point. And, um, yeah, I, mean, I think that's really excellent point. I also, um, I'm 
thinking about the question and thinking about like what aspects of uh, sex and sexuality hasn't been covered, and a lot of them keep coming up. I keep going, well, what about this? Oh, this game does that. You know, there's a lot out there now that actually addresses a wide range of different aspects of sexuality. Uh, a lot more games that are uh, inclusive in different ways of saying, yeah, be whatever, um, look like whatever, be into whatever, uh, than there were 20, 30 years ago. Um, so it's a really intriguing question. I would love for somebody to write a game that presented uh, the BDSM community in a way that was sort of holistic and realistic instead of fetishizing the fetishes, if you know what I mean. Um, that'd be kind of cool. Uh, I would, I'd kind of dig it if there was a game that had sexy old people, like people who were like 60 or 80 and, you know, or whatever, that'd be neat. Um, it's a, it's one of the things that from, from my other life of uh, dealing with sex ed and like everybody going, okay, right, sex is from when you're like 16 to when you're 25. And then... On either side of that, forget it. And I'm like, oh, God, you people, no, no, you sad, sad people. Anyway, um, so, but any other aspect of, like, what ground might be covered in sex and sexuality in gaming, I can think of, anything I can think of, I can think of a game that does it, maybe. Joe? Yeah, I think that... Um... What, what ground hasn't been covered is uh, the less interesting version of that question because, like Meg said, mm. the ground has generally been covered. But the ground that I'm excited to see covered more and better and iterated upon is... Um, so when I started playing Apocalypse World, um, there's this thing that Apocalypse World almost does uh, that I was really excited about. Um, and the first session advice for the MC is to just follow the characters around and to just understand what it is to live a day in their life. And so you, you, get, you start to get a sense of, like, so you don't have electricity in this post-apocalyptic community. How are you eating your food? Um, okay, but we're in a desert. Where are you getting that firewood from? And uh, without going into the kind of painstaking logistical bean counting, you, you can get into the more of the, like, imagining what it is to actually be another person and actually live inside of their clothes and sleep inside of their bed. Um, and Apocalypse World is almost a game about that but then usually veers in the direction of, and then a bike gang shows up. They've all got crazy <laughs> mohawks. They've all got Uzis. Now you never get to go back to, like, how do you cook your food again? Because bike gangs, they kind of Okay, take then MC, step it up in that game. You should be asking all those questions. <laughs> well, it's it's because the game is half uh, Ursula Le Guin's Always Coming Home and half uh, Under the Thunderdome or uh, yeah. Mad Max. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to see more games about... Um, that just stay in that place of just follow them around and see how they live their life. Just forever. We never need to raise the stakes. That's interesting, actually. And yeah. to tie it back to sex and romance, I would love to see games that just that do that, that don't need to problematize the relationships um, that they're depicting, that don't need to have them be new relationships that are, that are just starting and will they succeed, or relationships that are breaking up and, oh, my God, there's so much drama. I would like games that are more just... Like, those are all awesome, and I'm excited that those exist. And now I'm excited to see more games that are about, uh, what's this relationship like? What are Sunday mornings like? What are going to a vacation at the in-laws like? What does it mean to be 80 and living in a retirement home and fucking a whole bunch of people? <laughs> yeah. Emily, what about you? I think um, my answer kind of follows up on Joe's. Um, and it's funny because I, I was thinking about Sage's question. I'm like, oh, gosh, you know, like what I'm most excited about is happening, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's having more of these really personal stories being incorporated into games. And, and with it comes this really beautiful blossoming of, of uh, more diversity of story that we're getting to experience. And, um, you know, we're seeing it here in the United States in a lot of indie games like Joe's Games and Jackson Tegu and Ben Lehman and a lot of other people working on, you know, like really interesting questions um, and very personal 
experiences. And um, there's a lot of great stuff happening in uh, live action communities, um, like the Nordic scene um, that I talked about before. You know, the Danish scenario scene is just rife with these really interesting, very personal or, or you know crazy funny uh, types of games. And um, and uh, and there's a lot of great cross pollination that's happening um, where people can come out with games. Like uh, Lizzie Stark wrote one recently. Oh, do you have a question, Meg? Or? Go on. Yeah. Okay. Um, about dealing with um, uh, likelihood of getting breast cancer and the questions in that fallout. So, so I feel like for me, I feel like there's um, just a, an absolutely huge amount of the human experience that's the ground that hasn't been covered. And thank God we're at a place where this form is turning into something that allows us to access that. You know, it's 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 like writing all these these novels, these these you know films. So I'm I'm really glad to be doing right here right now watching that ground be broken yeah before we move on to um, curious question I, I did think of something that Emily what Emily just said made me think of that an area that I think is becoming talked about more is consequences of sex uh, as sex and sexuality enters into the possibility of thing, you know, things that are possible to do in the game uh, the consequences of sex um, become part of that conversation and I don't just mean emotional and physical, but dealing with STDs, which Apocalypse World deals with in some aspects, and dealing with pregnancy. And there are not a lot of great games out there yet that are directly looking at um, pregnancy, uh, but there are a couple. And the one I particularly want to mention is uh, Love in the Time of War uh, by Mario Bolzoni and uh, Luca Bellu. Uh, uh, that handles that process of there's a couple and the woman is pregnant and they're separated by the war and how does that affect, you know, that's part of their relationship. Um, and that's, it's really cool to see, um, along with all the things Emily was saying, that there's beginning to be a, uh, other aspects that sexuality isn't just about, oh my God, you're hot and I totally want you now. It's within the full scope of, of life. So, thanks. Thanks. Uh, all right, so we are nearly done here. I'd like to have one last question because I think it's a good wrap-up. And I'm going to start with uh, with Joe here. Kira Scott asked, what's a practical list of go-to sexy or sex games? Uh, okay, sexy tabletop <laughs> role-playing games. <laughs> Oh my goodness. There's I a lot of sexy games. I've got a I have tons if you want. What have you done? <laughs> Tabletop role playing games to play with my friends and, and then any educational sex games. Joe. Um, yeah, if you like exploring power dynamics, Hot Guys Making Out. If you want to be super confessional and exhibitionist, Bacchanalia. If you want to explore a dysfunctional train wreck that you can't take your eyes away from, um, Monster Hearts, that's kind of an answer filled with hubris, I know. Um, if you want to explore uh, what it means to be young, to be timid about your own body, um, and to be experiencing first crushes, silver and white, that's all I can think of right now. I would add to that list um, misspent youth for dealing with uh, exploring, you know, exploring some aspects of teenage sexuality. That's pretty cool. Um, Love in the Time of War, like I said, all of Emily's games, you know, pretty much all of Emily's games. Uh, Apocalypse World and Thousand One Nights for that bit. Um, and those would be the list that I would say are practical, you know, sexy games that could be full of fun, sexy stuff. Cool. You know, no, please, no, go ahead. Zach, did you have any to list out or any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would say, like, I'm with Plato in that, like, you learn a lot about people just by playing a game with them. And so I kind of think of it like, what are games where you learn about people? Um, mm -hmm. And I think Call of Cthulhu, um, like, the way you are a good Call of Cthulhu GM is you just let characters do, like, boring things until you can hit an emotion and then you just kind of play on that emotion until it turns into fear. Um, and you can learn a lot about people by how much they react to fear in-game, whether they react to fear in-game, 
whether they want to try to solve the puzzle tactically or whether they want to enjoy being insane. Um, like, you just learn so much at the table that is... It's not, it's not like a game where the, each player writes their part, but you do probe pretty hard uh, obliquely, like, without necessarily going toward any sort of sensitive issue just into, like, what kind of people are you dealing with at the table um, with Cthulhu. And I feel like every game I've ever played, you come away going, oh, that's the person who does this, and that's the person that's like that, and this is the person who's like that. Um, and, of course, D&D, because d and good at everything. Um, <laughs> no, I, literally there isn't anything d and not good at, because it's the best game. Um, but, in t- uh, like, for the same reason, largely, like, you learn so... Because there's so little... Um, there's so little pressure on people to come up with some... People don't know they're on the spot. Like, they don't know that they're revealing things about themselves by how they deal with the stuck door or something. And so, but what they actually do with something preposterous, like a rust monster or a door that only opens on two and six and you roll it three or four times and it just keeps not opening. Like, if you watch people carefully, because they... You learn the most about people when things are really important, like... Which kid do you save, Sophie? Or when things are <laughs> not important at all. Like, what are you naming your dog? Um, so D&D is really not important. Like, everything seems unimportant. And so I think you can really learn a lot about the other people at the table if you just kind of think, like, you compare, like, how each person deals with things. And so... While none of them are de- definitely sexual, they're definitely psychological in a way that might be interesting or educational uh, in other ways. Yeah. Cool. Any kind of problem-solving oriented game, really. Mm. I don't Emily. know. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Meg. I just uh, I'm not sure if these comments are going to show up in the long-term YouTube. Uh, version of this, so I just wanted to say that if you are actually looking for actual educational sex games, to check out the uh, Goofy Foot Guide to Getting It On from Goofy Foot Press, which is a pretty, ex- I mean, it has some it has some problems, not the time to get into that. Uh, it ties back to the thing about illustrations and diversity, and it tends to be in one little space, but there's some great games about, a great sex games in there to figure out things sexually with yourself and partner. Super fun. Dangerous. I had one more uh, game I wanted to add to my list. Um, no, you can't. Emily has to go. But you go, Joe. Oh, you had your chance. <laughs> What's the game? What's the game? I don't know. So, um, for um, a light-hearted, flirty romance game, or for a romantic comedy kind of game, um, Breaking the Ice. Oh. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I was I thought you might say GXB by Cell Style, which is another really fun, yes! lighthearted, beautiful dating game um, that is about young young students and falling in love. And it's it's you know it's not heavy on the sex side, although that could happen. But it but you know it, it's in that realm. Um, and uh, Human Contact is another game that I think about that actually is really interesting for thinking about sex and gender and in a science fiction setting. And uh, there's a lot of room for exploring a lot of different things when you go in that direction. Um, and there's some great games. Uh, again, uh, I'm the Nordic advocate here, but um, coming out of uh, uh, a bunch of different Nordic countries, uh, Summer Lovin' by uh, Anna Besterling. Is, uh, it's basically it's about coming back from the festival that you went to over the summer and talking about the sex that you had you know, in <laughs> the tent, you know, when you fell out or like, you know, it fell down in you or whatever. And it's it's a it's very graphic. And you get to hear it from both sides. So it's a he said, she said kind of thing. So there's a lot of humor there. And um, uh, and then there's, you know, lots more games that are more intimate. And one that I got to play was uh, My Girl's Sparrow, which was sort of going on this, this bondage weekend, very titillating, but then seeing what the fallout is in relationships. But, oh, my God, yeah, it, it, was, it was amazing. So um, there's a lot of interesting things out there. Um, and uh, those games, and a, lo- a lot of other information about the Nordic stuff you can find if you go to Nordic LARP Wiki. And uh, there's uh, various links there. So I hope people check it out. Great. Uh, we have come up on time. Uh, we have uh, other questions, and, and Nathan... I totally want to answer all the questions all the time. I know, I know. <laughs> it's, uh, 
you guys had so much interesting things to say. Nathan Hook had a bunch of great questions that were live. We tried to see that in. I'm sorry we didn't get to, to those, and there were other questions that were asked, and I didn't get to ask them live. I apologize. So, it's evidently huge. Like, we need to have a mega panel um, on this. Sequels. Also, for reals, I, I love talking about this. Oh, yeah. like, seriously love. So if anybody wants to come and talk to me about this more on G+, Totally down for that. Ask All questions. Right. Well, Talk. thank you, uh, thank you, Zach, thank you, Meg, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Emily. And, and did we see Monster Hearts? Because my God, that's the sexiest Hearts? game alive. <laughs> oh, oh, can he we said end hubris. On... He mentioned it hubrously. Okay, good. Can we can we that's end right. on the the anecdote of like what's the sexiest thing that's happened at your table? <laughs> sure. Do we have time uh, for that, please? We, that is up to you guys at this point. If, uh, if whoever <laughs> wishes to drop off and not tell their sexy an anecdote, feel free. Uh, no shame. And if you want to stay here and uh, and talk about that, then go ahead and we'll end with that. Uh, Judd Carlman had asked, um, what is uh, the hottest, craziest, most fun you ever had with a sexual act occurring in the fiction at your uh, gaming table? So I think Meg wants to go first. I do, because it's from Monster Hearts last night. Um, it was very creepy and very hot and very creepy. Uh, when um, Jackie, who I think was maybe a ghoul, was trying to eat uh, the hollow named Six, who turns out is made of marzipan. And it was... So there was like this strange, weird, creepy, awesome makeout scene between the two of them with all kinds of neat descriptions of nibblingness because uh, Jackie was unable to actually hurt Six due to other game things that a different character had done, forbidding her from hurting Six. But there was all this fun, awesome, weird, creepy hotness of the nibbling. I totally loved it. Anyway, I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Any other anecdotes, Joe? Did you have one? Yeah, I'm not sure how much it's going to translate because so much of what made this moment good was um, just the the facial expressions on people's faces and the tones and what words they chose to linger on and all that kind of thing. But we were playing Apocalypse World. Um, there were two rival communities. Uh, there was a, a big swamp in between them and um, the leaders of these communities, these hard holders, one of them... I don't remember his name, um, but he was a, a, a very utilitarian, pragmatic kind of person. He goes across the swamp to talk to this other hard holder. She's named White, and she's not pragmatic and utilitarian. Like She's wearing like a full white leather like onesie outfit with like outrageous hair and outrageous um, everything, kind of. And she's just like very flashy, very showy, and so kind of unnecessarily she draws a gun during their like totally polite, civil up until that moment conversation. And she's pointing it at him, uh, but she's still, like, she's flirting with him as well. And there's this great, like, scene of, like, she's probably going to do something. She doesn't seem like she's, it just doesn't seem like it's going to end as a conversation. So either she's going to kill him, or they're about to start having sex. Yeah. <laughs> like, this great, like, she, you know, like, she's moving the gun from, like, kind of waving it around to, like, it's against his chest. And now it's, like, it's kind of against his head, but also she's leaning close enough that, you know, if she were leaning three inches in, in closer, they'd be making out right now. <laughs> great, like, she's like, she's not even sure herself. It's pretty clear. Um, and then uh, she gets in just like that close, right? And the gun is, it's like next to his head, and she fires it up into the air as she starts to make out with him. And then we cut to black. Wow. That was it. Oh, Zach, I know you, you're, you're hunkering down in an internet cafe in San Diego. Did you have any, any uh, story you'd like to share? There, it's never come up. <laughs> like, sex has literally, like, never come up. Okay. Oh, what's I'm going to your... interrupt. I'm sorry. I'm not part of this interview, but I'm listening. Go it's for it. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so the only times that there has been sex or sexual contact in our games. We, we didn't role play it at all. It was just, it was more tactical. So our barbarian um, had sex with that dentist once because she was trying to get potions. 
Like, she wanted, like, an excuse to get into his room and take things. So there was that. Which isn't, like, sexy, actually, but that's one of the only times sex has happened in our game. Is that your story? No, the other time was when I commandeered <laughs> that army with a love demon. Oh, that's true, Which I was guess. kind of sexy in a control power way. I'm sure it was mm. to you. Yeah. <laughs> Commandeering is hot, as far as you're concerned. Power is hot. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So what that was awesome. awesome. <laughs> Emily? Okay. Um, um, I think my story, have, it has to be when I played um, uh, my girl Sparrow, and that um, it, it was in uh, in uh, Denmark, and uh, so there was a scene, and yeah, I described the scenario earlier, but it's uh, you know a, a bondage weekend, and there's all these uh, things under underlying that you don't know yet, and uh, it was the first scene of sex between my character and the other woman's character. Both characters were female, and um, uh, it was amazing and beautiful. And then the two other players, who were two gentlemen, they just it, it, uh, um, and uh, they just sat back and watched. And um, and the GM later said, "I was just taking notes the whole time." <laughs> <laughs> and it was perfectly appropriate. You know, that was the setting. We were all there for that. Um, but it was, um, yeah, it was something else. Awesome. We're over time. I'm going to indulge for two minutes and tell my own. I'm sorry. I have to. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. All right, so it's Apocalypse World, and I'm playing um, Orc the Faceless. So so a Faceless is a character that wears a mask, and a lot of his powers come with his mask. And when he takes off his mask, he's usually pretty weak. And uh, the Brainer's name was Pearl, and both of them had had some really, really rough times. She was... Not she is nigh insane from things that have broken her, and, and to- she's been tortured. And um, Lark, which is the person who became Orc, the reason he found Orc was he was dying after being uh, basically gang raped and jumped and and curb stomped and really really messed up. So they end up up on this roof, uh, and their flirtation is comparing scars and talking about what has happened to those who scarred them. Um, and then eventually, uh, he's 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 basically take he takes off his mask and says, you know, uh, if we can be together now, I'll have a connection to you and I can protect you in the future. And and she says yes. And and mm. so he wow. has no mask and she's shown her scars and and it was a pretty surprisingly romantic moment. Mm. So there's that. Sweet. Uh, anyway, thanks everyone um, for the extra time, and I'm sorry we went over. Uh, this was great, and uh, everyone have an excellent evening. And thanks for watching this uh, game game night event for Indie Plus. Thank you, thanks, Rich. folks. Thanks. Good to yeah. see. You.